This is your life, a program for all America. And now here he is, Mr. This is your life himself, Ralph Edwards. Welcome again to This Is Your Life. Now, tonight we bring you the story of a flag rescued from the hands of an American soldier who died in the bloody Battle of Bataan, and uh, one of the men who cherished, revered, and defended that flag through three heartbreaking years, and finally restored it to its rightful place of glory to wave once again or the land of the free. Now, I understand that our principal subject is getting out of a car now. That's why I keep sort of looking here in the parking lot next door. In just a moment, uh, is he coming now? His friends are coming. Okay, I'll just step out there. Let's see what happens. There he comes. I'll be right with you in a minute. I'll let him get up here a little more before I step out. You're wondering probably which one it is. I can't even see him yet. There's supposed to be three men, are they? Uh, excuse me. Hello there. Aren't you Clay Connor? Yes. Hello, Clay. Of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana? Yes, of course. <laughs> well, uh, uh, my name's Ralph Edwards, Clay, and I've been looking forward to meeting you and to tell you that the dinner meeting that you'd planned uh, for tonight uh, has been postponed for a little while because, uh, you see, tonight, <laughs> right now, in fact, Henry Clay Connor... This is your life. Oh. <laughs> Come here, say it. Oh, I'm... <laughs> I'm sure you've guessed by now we had something to do. Stay in here, Mr. Steig, uh, with your being here in Hollywood, and that your good friend Jack Steig of Indianapolis. Thank you so much, Jack. Wonderful to be here, Ralph. Yeah. No, what a wonderful good, good fellow you are. To get him here. And you are the man to do it. Uh, he's been our prime helper in uh, staging this surprise, but the meetings and conferences you planned are on the level, Clay, so don't worry about that. And I'm sure that your life, exemplifying complete and unquestioning devotion to your country and your flag in the jungle-covered mountains of a far-off land, and your daily active concern for the welfare and spiritual peace of your fellow man will be a lasting inspiration to us all. Okay, boy? Well, Ready? I don't, I don't know what to say. Well, you don't have to say anything. We're going to take you in here and <laughs> tell you a few things about your... Escort your friend Clay Connor to our stage, please, Jack Steed, and to our chair of honor. I'll be with you in just a moment. Here we go. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> He says, gee, I don't deserve this. I've... Come on, sit over here so all America can see you, especially Indianapolis, the gang back there. This is your life, and we're proud to relive it with you, Clay. This is Thursday, November 27th, 1941, Thanksgiving Day. Where were you this Thursday, 14 years ago, Clay? Well, I, uh, I was either on my way to Manila or I was there. Just about landed in the Philippines. Yes, I think that's right. As a second lieutenant in the Air Force, yeah. uh, where were you at that time? You mean in, in the Philippines? Yes, where were you at station? I was sent uh, just outside Manila to Fort McKinley. They sent the uh, Air Force group out there because there wasn't room for us at... Uh, and then you went on up to Maravellas, weren't oh, you? Yes, we went around the uh, bay to Maravellas. That was the uh, part of the tent. Sort of an outpost. We there. went there on December 25th. This Thanksgiving Day, 1941, our flag still flies above Manila, Corregidor, and Maravellas. And then... December 7th and Pearl Harbor. How soon after that were you attacked in the Philippines, Clay? We were hit the same day, but of course, uh, the international dateline, you know, make, it made it December the 8th there. Yes. And uh, was a little later as far as the time element was concerned, but it was the same day. And of course, we didn't believe it. it we, we just thought it was, it was a miracle, a myth, really. It didn't make sense. With the Japanese forces swarming over the island of Luzon, you men of the small defending force of Americans are constricted in the peninsula of Bataan. And when Bataan falls, the flag of the beleaguered 26th Cavalry is rescued by an unknown soldier, and this battle-torn American flag is one day to play a dramatic part in your life. 
But here, after four months of bravely and incredibly holding out to make the enemy's success come bitterly high, your small communications group at Maravellis receives radio orders to surrender. There are only six of you physically well enough to attempt escape. So, with your commanding officer's blessing, you six men plunge into the dense jungle. What was your uh, plan, Clay? I don't think we really had any plans. Uh, there was so much confusion in one thing and another that uh, we really wanted to try to stay free from the Japanese as long as we could in order to... Uh, you know, we were very, uh, very optimistic. We thought the Americans would be back any minute. I think it was our plan to, to just try to hold out. Uh, you wanted to join uh, Colonel good. Thorpe's guerrilla outfit there in the mountains, <clears throat> Oh, yes, you? yes, that's true. We did behind the enemy lands, uh, yes. to, uh, lines to harass them. Sick yes. with dysentery and malaria, you fall more and more behind your five comrades. And in the end, they reluctantly have to leave you behind. Now you're on your own, Clay. I first came across Clay in a little hut in the middle of the steaming jungle, being cared for by a loyal Filipino named Mar Margrito. I'm sure you know who that is, don't you, Clay? I sure do. It's Frank Gervais, one of my... In fact, I guess he's my best friend. You first saw this fellow carrying a sick buddy piggyback to that little hut in the jungle. He went back and carried two more men out of the jungle that day. Here from Aurora, Illinois, where he's now a mail carrier, the ex-West Virginia coal miner with whom you fought and suffered and faced death many times in those three years, Clay, your old buddy, Frank Govey. Here's Frank. <laughs> you boys sit down here together because we've got lots to talk about. You as well as anyone else must know what Clay had been through when you found him there half delirious in that hideaway hut, Frank. That's right, Ralph. Uh, Japanese patrols were everywhere. We... Uh, we tried to uh, travel through the jungles, but we took chances with the Japs rather than the jungles because they were so dangerous. Yes, sick and starved, close to death for 10 days. Your body actually reduced to skin and bones. Your thoughts often stray back to your childhood in Indiana and those wonderful biscuits your Aunt Ida used to bake, Clay. Oh, no, really? <laughs> <laughs> you, all that time during the war, I kept thinking to myself, I wonder if that poor boy is getting enough to eat. Now, I don't know if you heard all of that. that. The lady that said that you loved those biscuits. It's your beloved and item is William S. Corner of Indianapolis, Mrs. Cotton. Here she is. As a boy, Clay just wouldn't eat any biscuits except his Aunt Ida's. Is that right, Miss Connor? Yeah, it is. And you know, you remember the night we took you to, over on the Radiant to eat dinner and you wouldn't eat your biscuits? Well, they, you were, they were on their way to didn't, didn't Pennsylvania. Have you were going to, to Pennsylvania. You know, she's the only one that gave me make the, put the sugar on the biscuits. That's, well, that's what I never <laughs> told her that, but yeah. She... <laughs> I was making a bit of my biscuits. And the man next table said, oh, Clay, or little boy, he said, if you don't behave, you're not going to got any Santa Claus. He said, I don't care. I'm not going to move here. be here. I'm going to move to Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> that old boy, grown to manhood by 1941 and fighting for his life and his country in far off Luzon, would have been glad for even the restaurant biscuits, Mrs. Connor, sure. let alone yours. Thank you very much. Ad Ida, Mrs. Well, William we'll Connor. Until later. <laughs> okay. May 6th. 1942. With the fall of Corregidor, organized resistance on Luzon comes to an end. Your health partly restored, Clay, you leave Margarito's hut. Did you ever reach Colonel Thorpe, Clay? No, no, I never did. Uh, Thorpe we... was betrayed and captured, wasn't he? That's right. Uh, of course, we tried to find him and tried to get some bona fide orders from his headquarters, but it was a mass of confusion and politics and killing, it was a mess. But in December of 1942, Clay did make contact with uh, Thorpe's group, didn't he, Frank? Yes, and Captain Bell, who uh, took over in Colonel Thorpe's place, authorized Clay to uh, organize guerrillas in this area. Yes. So once more you dive into the lowland jungle, shunning the mountains, the domain of the savage pygmy, Negritos, feared as much by the Filipinos themselves as the Japanese invaders. Stealthily, you Make your way from native village to village, roaming and fighting through Luzon, collecting enemy information and organizing various native groups. 
I bet that old jalopy you and your roommate had at Duke University would have come in mighty handy here, Clay. <laughs> I don't think it would have been much good to you, Clay. It was on its last legs when you and I bought it for 60 bucks in 1939. Recognize that voice? Bob Stivers, yeah. <laughs> your college roommate at Duke, now with the Great West Life Assurance Company in Cincinnati, Ohio, Bob Stivers. Here's Bob. <laughs> paid sixty dollars for that car bob that's a lot of money for a couple of college boys in those days isn't it well you know let me tell you something what he did yeah he was taking business law see yeah. and he learned that if you're under 21 you can always get your money back <laughs> so he got me on the corner and he says let's go get him <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we, had, we had to pool our money, our yeah. real money and our book money, yeah. to come up and get that car. And then to replace it, we had to go out and sell uh, food out in the dormitories at night. That's right. <laughs> students' laundry oh, and yeah. things we, like that. We took care of students' laundry, too. <laughs> well, was the car worth all this, Bob? Oh, yes. We had a lot of fun in that car. Do you remember? We uh, had to lay on the front fender and hold a headlight wire in so it worked. You got me with my tails That's on. That's right. <laughs> Always. Sounds pretty resourceful to me, a quality you'll find mighty useful in the Philippines, Clay, just three years later. Thank you, Bob Stivers of Cincinnati. Here on the campus. No. March 15th, 1943. You're making progress, Clay Connor, organizing guerrilla groups until you and Frank Gauvet and three others in a small village are betrayed and ambushed. Now, what happened then, Frank? Remember Le Cobb Clay? We were completely oh, yeah. surrounded, and the Japs, we, we waded through their fire and uh, escaped into the Coogan grass where they tried to set the fire. Well, now, they couldn't find Clay because he was in this grass. Is that it? Why, why couldn't they burn you out, Clay? Well, there was a, uh, fortunately, I found a, a mud hole in the middle of this tall grass and, and dug it out and buried myself underneath the mud. And as it burned out, why, uh, of course, it didn't burn right in my area. Half tracks came by throwing out flares. And I had one shell left at that time, and it was quite a decision whether I should be captured and tortured like I'd seen others or maybe kill myself but as the Lord would have it why I just kind of passed out and when I awoke they were gone you've been standing nose deep in this mud mosquitoes eating at your head many times you outwit the enemy like this clay but you can't outwit malaria and it's Frank Gauvet here who carries you unconscious back to the temporary safety of the jungle saving your life that's right Yes, but Ralph, uh, Clay helped me also. Remember the time I had pneumonia for seven days and seven nights, sir, where I was out? And uh, you took care of me. Then uh, when I came to, you had this Negrito witch doctor doing the hoodoo dance and as sick as I was, I had to laugh at it. <laughs> he wasn't taking any chances, was he? You know, the only reason he's telling this, I, the only reason they took care of me, you see how big this fellow is? He used to be a lot bigger. And the, it was a long way to the lowland to get the rice and the salt. We were way back. He built a farm back there. We could have been there for a hundred years. And whenever we needed more salt and rice, he was just the man to go get it. You can see how <laughs> capable and big he is. Uh, I wanted to make sure I took good care of him. Well, well thank you, <laughs> Frank Govey of Aurora, Illinois. When you men had to be your own army, Clay. <laughs> I want to tell this, Clay, a senior officer, when they had to be their own army, designated himself major and so on down the line with the Filipino and American Army fugitives. They had to do that. And after the war, this country honored your appointments by making them stick. Thank you, Captain Frank Gavey of Aurora, Illinois. Thank you. We know that you worked to restore freedom to the Philippines and glory to the flag of our republic, that your mission was accomplished, we know. How? We'll learn in a few moments. Ready to go back now? to the Philippine Islands, June 1943, where valiant patriots were fighting a war behind the scenes. This is your life, Clay Connor of Indianapolis, Indiana. I, I just can't believe it. I mean, it just doesn't seem possible. I... There were many underground factions bent on destroying the common enemy, but each native leader had his own private goal. Isn't that right, Clay? And you were in a, uh, charge of a group of Yusafis, 
Yes. The, uh, that means United States Armed Forces Far East. That's the right. Hucks hated the Usafis. The bandits pillaged and killed anybody and everybody. And That's right. all of them were deathly afraid of the savage pygmies, the little negritos. This is the situation that faces you that summer of 1943 as you lie in a jungle outpost recovering from malaria. We Filipinos knew that our only hope for freedom rested in the hands of our American allies. Now, Clay, can you tell us whose voice that is? I don't know if you even realize he's alive. There was a time when you thought he wasn't. Thirteen years ago, he was a boy doing the work of a man. He nursed you when you were sick, brought you food and information about enemy positions, and risked death and torture constantly in your service. Here from Pampanga, Philippines, is your loyal friend whom you last saw 11 years ago, Democrito Lumalan. Democrito. His brother was killed. Just how did Major I, Clay Connor uh, ever do what no one else had done, Democrito, gain the confidence and help of the deadly little Negritos? He happened to befriend two Negrito boys and got them to take him to their chief, Kujaro Laksamana. Uh, he befriended the, the two uh, little boys and took him to the chief. Well, this was the most dangerous move, wasn't it, Democrito, for Clay to face the savage people alone? Yes, but Clay was smart enough to have learned some of their language and that impressed the Negrito so much that they agreed to join forces with us. Uh, fortunately, something else of great importance happened about this time, didn't it, Democrito? Yes, one day, Filipino scout came into our camp and presented Clay an American flag. This flag was the flag of 26 cavalry rescued during the Battle of Bataan. The flag that had been rescued at Bataan was presented to Clay. Well, now you have a symbol, Clay, around which to rally your forces. The wild Negritos come out of their mountain strongholds and fight the Japanese in the open. This show of strength brings countless other fighting men to your side, and with it, new hope to the Filipino cause. Thank you very much, Democrito Lumenlan of the Philippines. The courage of you and your people will never be forgotten. You have a Your guerrilla group now has three main objectives, Clay Connor, to fight the enemy, to gather valuable information to be passed on to allied intelligence. And rescuing flyers shot down over Luzon. Whose voice is that? Do you know, Clay? It belongs to a Navy flyer shot down over Luzon on December 7th, 1944. Right. Now in the manufacturing business in Denver, Colorado, here is H. Clay right, Hogan. That's it. Another Clay. Can you imagine two Clays coming together in the jungle of Luzon? What happened to you when oh. you were shot down, Clay Hogan? I was picked up by a band of Negritos that had been organized by Clay and taken to him. You helped Clay there in resistance work for about a month and a half, didn't you, Clay? That's right. And then Clay asked me to take some vital information uh, regarding minefields that had been planted around Clark Field out. So Democrito and two other Filipinos guided me through the enemy lines and we met the advancing American force. And Ralph, if it hadn't been for Clay Connors, I wouldn't be here tonight. Thank you, well, Clay Hogan of Denver. You know, just a second, you know the most wonderful thing that happened, he came down the trail with these scouts we'd sent out, and I said, what's your name? He says, Clay. Well, I never met anybody with that name. I looked at him, you know, and I thought, boy, have I been here a long time. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Clay Hogan of Denver. January 1945, the American army lands on Luzon, and on January 28th, you lead your army, a thousand Filipinos and a thousand Negritos, down onto the Luzon Plain. With your heroic officers beside you, one of them carrying the American flag, rescued a baton, and all of you sing in California, here I come. You report your force and present your flag to Lieutenant General O.W. Griswold at his 14th Corps Army Headquarters at Concepcion on Luzon. And here from Colorado Springs, Colorado, is General Griswold, now retired. Here's the general. Come here. I feel like this is a great honor to have you here, sir. That January 28, 1945, was one of the most moving experiences of my life. In presenting his troops and the flag, uh, to me, you said at that time, General, I want you to know that the sun has never ceased to shine on the American flag on the island of Luzon. You remember that? Yes, sir. I then wrote in my notebook these words. This act is one of the finest, 
finest examples of loyalty ever shown to a national color. It should, should become historic in the annals of all our armed forces and a proud tradition in the history of the 26th United States Cavalry. Thank you, General O.W. Bishop. Having escaped death for three years, you return to the jungle as a volunteer for three more weeks to aid the fresh American forces. And then, mission accomplished, you can think at last of mom, dad, and home. They never once lost faith that you would be found alive. Your dad even tried to enlist while you were on Luzon to find and help his boy. He passed on in 1951 and your mother a few months later. But the joy of reunion with you had been theirs. You're a man of many friends, Clay, of the Negritos, of Chief Laxamana. He and his people remember the brave American under whom they fought for liberation. As we can see in this film we had made in Luzon just two weeks ago, there's your friend, the Chief, pointing to his headquarters. And uh, you're going to see, there they are, they're coming up here, members of his family and tribe, there they are, doing a ceremonial dance in your honor, Clay. These were made especially for you. Back in Indianapolis, Indiana, you pick up your civilian life in the insurance business, you fall in love and marry. How many children do you have, Clay? Four. All boys. Well, they're an important part of your life now, so here they are from Indianapolis, your lovely wife, Libby, and the four boys, Tommy, age one, Jimmy, three, Jack, six, and Clay, two, eight. Come on, let's get up here where we can see them all here. Sit down over there, Mommy. There's Daddy. My goodness, that's quite a squad you have there, Clay. You run over. Daddy, you sit here. Oh, my, I'm all over the place. Daddy, you sit here. Libby, over there. He's happy now. Clay, you got to come around here, pal, so you I can know, talk to you. You know, when I married an Indianapolis girl, I found out in Indiana that basketball was a wonderful sport. <laughs> But you know, I found out just not long ago, this is it, so <laughs> we've got to find a substitute from some other family. Clay Connor, when your country was in need, you fought for it. When your flag was in peril, you defended it. Your textbook is the Bible, which you read daily and which you read eight times in the jungles of Luzon. The spiritual strength that carried you through the ordeal of Luzon and the loss of your parents now helps you comfort others in your great work for your fellow man back home in Indiana. This is your life, Major Clay Conn. <laughs> this has been your past, your present, and a moment we look into your future. Clay Connor, Trell has arranged a party in your honor at the Knickerbocker Hotel here in Hollywood, where, where all your out-of-town friends have been uh, staying in your family over at the Knickerbocker. What's that, Tommy? Oh, he wants Daddy, too. The whole mob wants him. <laughs> As a permanent record of this night, Trell will see to it that you receive a film of this show and a Bell and Howell projector to show it on, Clay, for your wife, Libby, here. Marshall Jewelers of New York City has designed... Yeah, you can look at it, too, Tommy. This 14-karat gold charm bracelet. And for you, uh, hang on to this, uh, Tommy. Oh, here, we didn't take the paper off. It's beautiful. I want you to see it. Each little charm represents something real nice in there. And uh, these uh, beautiful cufflinks and tie clasps for you. And <laughs> now we know of your affection for the little people in the mountains of Luzon and the promise you made that you would someday try to send them much-needed medical supplies. Well, as a tribute to you and to your Negrito friends who fought by your side, Clay, Prell will see to it that $1,000 worth of carefully selected medical supplies will be distributed among the Negritos for you. This is your life, Clay Connor of Indianapolis, Indiana, a life dedicated to the principles set down in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. One nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Clay Connor. Good night and God bless you.